Preparations for Starship Flight 4 are in full swing at Starbase. From the ship to the booster and launch pad, everything is gearing up for the upcoming flight test. The launch pad recently underwent a full system check, including the activation of new horizontal propellant storage tanks. And SpaceX isn't stopping there, they've already begun testing for flights beyond IFT-4. Plus, NASA just unveiled the master plan for the Starship in Space Refueling demo, targeted for next year. Join us as we delve into these latest developments. Starship 29 and Super Heavy Booster 11 prototypes, which will be launched on the fourth integrated flight test, continue their preparations for the upcoming wet dress rehearsal and the subsequent flight test. Ship 29's heat tile upgrade work is nearly finished, with teams diligently replacing many of the tiles over the past couple of weeks. These new heat tiles with better adhesives will ensure Ship 29 survives atmospheric re-entry during IFT-4. Meanwhile, Booster 11 is undergoing thorough inspections, checkouts, and assembly verifications on a processing stand inside the Mega Bay. The hot stage ring was recently moved into the Mega Bay for installation on the booster. The ring might have already been installed on the booster. Visual confirmation is pending due to the Mega Bay's new large door blocking the view. Upon readiness, Ship 29 and Booster 11 will be transported to the launch site for the full stack wet dress rehearsal. A successful wet dress rehearsal will set the stage for the fourth integrated flight test, targeted before the end of this month. The launch pad repairs and upgrade work have entered their final phase. As you may know, the orbital launch mount is equipped with 20 hold down clamps, designed to anchor the booster securely during the initial stages of launch preparation. The clamps are released once the engines ignite and the booster is ready for liftoff. Several of those clamps were replaced after Flight 3, and in the past week, their strength underwent rigorous testing with the assistance of an LR-11000 heavy-duty crane. During testing, the crane lifted and lowered the clamp test jig, essentially a large steel plate, into the launch mount. Each clamp individually held the plate while the crane applied force to simulate the conditions experienced during booster engine ignition. Impressively, all the clamps passed the test, affirming their readiness to support a fully-fueled launch vehicle. An extensive long-duration launch pad infrastructure test was conducted at the launch site on April 30th. Propellant venting was observed from the site on Tuesday morning, signaling the launch pad and tank farm are being tested. Venting was first observed from several of the nine newly installed horizontal storage tanks, signaling that the tanks were operational. The tanks are designed to store liquid methane, oxygen, and nitrogen for future launch activities. Propellants from these tanks are routed to the launch pad via a system of heat exchangers, pumps, valves, and plumbing, all of which underwent testing the past week. Vigorous venting was observed from the launch mount and the launch tower, signaling the testing of the plumbing that delivers propellants to the launch vehicle. However, no major venting was observed from Starship Quick Disconnect Mechanism that delivers propellant to the Starship upper stage. Maybe SpaceX needs to complete more repairs and fixes on the ship Quick Disconnect before testing it. The launch tower catching and stacking arms were tested several times on Tuesday, parallel to the launch pad testing. The left arm demonstrated increased speed in its operation, attributed to the recent installation of an upgraded actuator. SpaceX intends to attempt catching the booster with the tower arms as early as the fifth integrated flight test. The actuator plays a crucial role in precisely controlling the horizontal movement of the launch tower arms, thereby governing their opening and closing actions for rocket catching. The right arm's actuator may also be replaced soon, so that both arms can execute faster movements necessary for successful rocket catching. During Tuesday's testing, the left arm bounced a little bit at the end of its motion, which is a bit alarming. Let's hope that SpaceX will fix this issue immediately, and the arm will be able to open and close without any hiccups. The launch pad testing on Tuesday lasted for over five hours, with a significant focus on commissioning the horizontal storage tanks. It now looks like the tanks will be fully operational before IFT-4. Once the horizontal tanks are completely ready to support activities at the launch site, SpaceX can decommission the remaining vertical storage tanks at the tank farm. Once the vertical tanks are removed, SpaceX will have adequate space at the tank farm to install the newly delivered heat exchangers and small bullet tanks. The bullet tanks will store water in the future, while the heat exchangers, in conjunction with the new pumps, will enhance the speed of fuel loading into the launch vehicle. In a recent update to the NASA Advisory Council Human Exploration and Operations Committee, the agency provided insights into various key aspects of the Artemis missions, including updates on Starship timelines. Amit Kshatriya, Deputy Associate Administrator of NASA's Moon to Mars program, revealed that the Starship test program is gaining momentum, with the next test flight slated for the end of May.
He emphasized that SpaceX has thoroughly analyzed data from the March test flight and has implemented numerous corrective measures to Flight 4 vehicles. While engineers continue to analyze the results of the tank-to-tank -tank cryogenic transfer demonstration conducted during the third Starship flight in March, Kshatriya affirmed that the test was successful by all accounts. SpaceX is presently focused on developing docking mechanisms, navigation, disconnects, and hot gas thrusters, all of which are crucial steps before conducting the ship-to-ship -ship propellant transfer demo scheduled for 2025. During the demo mission, SpaceX plans to launch two Starship full stacks from Starbase, the Target and the Chaser. The Target ship would launch first and enter orbit. The Chaser ship would then launch to catch up to the Target. The two ships will autonomously dock belly to belly as they fly a couple hundred kilometers above the Earth. They will connect using the same quick disconnect port SpaceX uses to load propellants on the launch pad. Then, SpaceX will adjust tank pressures and fire propellant settling thrusters, enabling propellant flow from the chaser to the target. The propellants will transfer using a pressure differential between the donor and recipient tanks. To limit boil-off, both ships involved in the refueling demo will feature thermal insulation and vacuum jacketing around internal plumbing. After completing the mission, both the target and chaser ships will execute a deorbit burn and return to Earth. During upcoming Starship test flights, engineers will measure propellant slush and monitor boil-off rates of methane and liquid oxygen in space. These findings will facilitate precise calculations for the number of refueling tankers required to fill up a Starship destined for the Moon. SpaceX currently estimates approximately 10 refueling launches for one Artemis landing mission. According to Kshatriya, the current plan entails SpaceX utilizing a single launch pad for both flights. As NASA and SpaceX progress toward a lunar landing, multiple Starship tankers will depart from at least two launch pads to aggregate propellants at a depot to supply the moon-bound Starship. In line with these plans, SpaceX intends to construct an additional launch tower at Starbase in Texas and establish at least two Starship pads on Florida's Space Coast. Foundation work for the construction of Pad 2 is already underway at Starbase near the suborbital tank farm. Extensive soil compaction has been conducted at the site to improve the stability and load-bearing capacity of the land. Piling work began a few days ago, and rebars are being installed inside the drilled holes. Pile foundations are often used where the ground is too weak to underpin the structure. They will transfer loads from the pad above it to the ground. Starship 30, which has been undergoing engine installation inside Mega Bay 2 since the first week of April, emerged from the building early Wednesday morning and commenced its journey towards the launch site. Upon arrival, the ship was positioned atop the test stand in preparation for imminent static fire testing. Meanwhile, Super Heavy Booster 13 underwent two consecutive cryogenic proof tests at the Massey's test site over the past week. The first test, which took place on April 26, began with filling the methane tank of the booster with liquid nitrogen. The booster was kept in that state for the next few hours, and in the meantime, the hydraulic rams installed on the test stand exerted force on the aft section of the booster, simulating the force of the inner 13 Raptor engines. The test provides engineers with the valuable data they need to determine if a booster can endure various kinds of stresses and whether the structure has any leaks. The second cryoproof test, conducted on the 29th, focused on filling the oxygen tank with liquid nitrogen to evaluate its structural integrity. Having successfully completed both tests, Booster 13 will soon return to the production site for engine installation in preparation for static fire testing. Booster 13 is slated to be launched along with Ship 31 in the sixth integrated flight test. Now, let's discuss some of the latest updates from the world of science and technology. China is set to launch its historic Chang'e 6 lunar sample return mission this week, with a target launch date of May 3. This mission will attempt to obtain the first ever soil and rock samples from the lunar far side and transport them back to Earth. The Chang'e 6 spacecraft comprises an orbiter, a re-entry module, a lander, and an ascender, totaling approximately 8,200 kilograms at liftoff. Following liftoff on the Long March 5 rocket from the Wenchang Satellite Launch Center, the spacecraft will travel to the moon and enter lunar orbit. Subsequently, the lander and ascent vehicle will detach and descend to the surface, aiming for a landing in the southern part of the Apollo crater on the lunar far side. Once on the lunar surface, the lander will utilize a drill and scoop to collect up to 2 kilograms of lunar material from the surface and up to 2 meters below. This collected sample will be transferred to an ascent vehicle, which will launch back into lunar orbit and rendezvous with the orbiter module. The samples will then be robotically transferred into a re-entry capsule, the orbiter will then separate from the ascent vehicle and return to Earth. Just before reaching Earth, 
the reentry capsule will separate from the orbiter and plummet through the atmosphere, parachuting to a soft landing to safely deliver the precious lunar samples. The entire mission is expected to last approximately 53 days. The Chang'e 6 mission will carry various international scientific instruments to explore and enhance our understanding of the moon. France supplied the detection of outgassing radon instrument to detect radon outgassing from the lunar crust. Sweden contributes the negative ions on lunar surface payload, an instrument for detecting and measuring negative ions reflected by the lunar surface. Additionally, an Italian passive laser retroreflector will be on board for laser range finding of the lander. Pakistan's 7 kg IQ CubeSat will carry two optical cameras to image the lunar surface from orbit. The return of the Chang'e 6 samples to Earth will mark another significant milestone for China's space program, following the successful Chang'e 5 mission in 2020, which brought back over 1.7 kg of lunar material. The samples from Chang'e 6 are expected to offer valuable insights into the history and evolution of the Moon. Analysis of this material could help elucidate differences between the near and far sides of the Moon and shed light on the late heavy bombardment period when the Moon and other inner solar system bodies experienced a high rate of large impacts. Beyond its scientific significance, the Chang'e 6 mission represents a crucial technological and programmatic achievement for China's lunar exploration ambitions. The nation aims to establish a permanent lunar base through the International Lunar Research Station program in the 2030s and conduct crewed lunar missions by the end of the decade. The SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket successfully launched Europe's two Galileo navigation satellites into orbit on Saturday, April 27, from Kennedy Space Center's Launch Complex 39A. Two minutes and 50 seconds after liftoff, the rocket's second stage separated from the first stage booster, ignited its single Merlin engine, and continued its journey into space. It was the 20th and final launch for this Falcon 9's first stage, tail number B1060 in the SpaceX fleet. Unlike previous missions, SpaceX did not recover the booster this time. On most Falcon 9 launches, there is often enough fuel left in the first stage after stage separation to allow the vehicle to return to Earth and land on a landing pad or a drone ship. However, this time the booster was depleted of propellants for the return trip because of the extra performance necessary to place the payload to medium Earth orbit. While B1060 was not recovered on this flight, with 20 successful missions, it marked the most flight-proven booster to launch a customer payload. In the future SpaceX plans to use both its boosters and its payload fairings for up to 40 missions each. In contrast to previous Galileo satellite launches, Saturday's mission was shrouded in secrecy. SpaceX ended its webcast after confirming payload fairing separation and did not provide a view of the payload deployment. The European Union Agency for the Space Program which handles Galileo operations confirmed the satellites were deployed into a 23,000 km medium Earth orbit and are operating. The reason for the heightened secrecy was unclear, especially considering that previous Galileo satellite launches on Ariane and Soyuz rockets from French Guiana had greater coverage. Galileo is Europe's global navigation satellite system, operational since December 2016, designed to provide accurate and reliable positioning and timing information to both civilians and military authorities. The recent launch of two satellites brings the Galileo constellation to a total of 30, orbiting Earth at an altitude of 23,000 kilometers. Plans are underway for the next generation of satellites, expected to start operations post-2025 to replace older equipment, which can then be used for backup capabilities. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.